colleagues, uh, I would like to um, draw your attention to myself. <laughs> uh, I know that shortly ESCOM is going to do its thing, but I've been assured that uh, it won't affect us, and so we can just plow into what we have to do, and ESCOM can do what they have to do. Uh, so I would like to welcome all of you for this public lecture. Um, our first public lecture for the year 2023, and we are really pleased that John uh, was able to to offer to give this public lecture. So thank you again, all of you who are coming uh, for this talk. And we do have quite a number of individuals on, uh, on online. Some of them think that uh, um, COVID is still around, but, uh, um, but so we welcome everybody and we'll have an opportunity in the question and answer to, um, to recognize uh, some of our colleagues that are online. Um, as is tradition uh, for the public lecture, we usually ask uh, a colleague from Stellenbosch University, one of the departments, that is closely linked with the speaker for the day to introduce uh, the speaker. And um, uh, for this uh, speech, um, John will be introduced by Dr. Tanya de Villiers Arthur. And thank you very much. She told me she would have come to the lecture anyway. But I would like to introduce her first, and then I'll ask her <laughs> to. <laughs> yeah, for, for some of you who are new, welcome to Steers. And uh, my name is Edward, Edward Chirumira. I'm the director of Steers. Um, we don't have that many um, announcements, and the main announcement is to thank uh, Tanya here for accepting. So Tanya is uh, a senior lecturer in the Department of Philosophy at the Stellenbosch University. She obtained her PhD at Stellenbosch University. Um, and so she's used to the students' noise at the beginning of the semester. Dr. Um, De, Vill uh, De Villiers Botha, Botha's research interests are in the field of semiotics, philosophy of mind and cognitive science, and you can see the relationship with the uh, speaker's topic today, uh, meta-ethics and the epistemology and ethics of AI, evolution, linguistics, and language sciences. And I've seen some of the work that she's done. She had a, uh, she had a piece on, uh, on Google, and, 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 and so we, uh, we will probably invite you to speak to that at some stage. Tanya is currently the coordinator of the Data and Computational Ethics Research Group of Stellenbosch University Philosophy Department and a member of the Global AI Ethics Consortium of the Institute for the Ethics of Artificial Intelligence uh, at the Technical University in Munich. So, but for now, she's here, and I would like to uh, welcome you and ask you to come and introduce our speaker. Thank you. Technical classification, the relation of the technical um, science uh, to everyday biological science and to the traditional problems of essentialism, um, adaptationism and optimality, reductionism, um, indeterministic accounts of causality, evolution and the limitations of evolutionary psychology and the biological basis of sex and gender. Um, and as you may know, he's made very significant contributions on, on all of these topics. Um, if I can mention a few, um, he developed a non-reductive, indeterministic and pluralistic metaphysic in his monograph, Disorder of Things, Metaphysical Foundations of the Disunity of Science. Um, which he argued is better suited to understanding contemporary science and its biology than the monoistic, physicalist, um, metaphysical worldview that most contemporary philosophers ascribe to. Um, he also developed an ex extended critical discussion of evolutionary psychology and rational choice theory, which culminated in a publication, um, Human Nature and the Limits of Science, 
Um, in term, he's also worked on, on um, philosophical issues relating to the interpretation and implications of genetics and genomics. And then for the last 15 years, he's been developing a process metaphysics of life, um, which resulted in the anthology Everything Flows toward the processual uh, philosophy of biology, in which he develops a process-centered ontology. And um, I'm assuming that today's lecture is going to be a, an extension of that project. Um, and he also states that um, he's basically exploring the implications of a process ontology for our understanding of, of human existence, um, which is also going to form the topic for his upcoming Gifford lectures in Edinburgh. So, Professor Dupre, thank you very much. We're looking forward to seeing your developments <laughs> um, in that research field. Thank you, first of all, for that very kind introduction. Um, and um, I should think the first thing I should just say is how happy I am to be here. It's a real privilege and a delight to be at Steas for three months, um, only problem not being longer. But um, it is a wonderful place for intellectual work. The, the environment, the staff, everything is just perfect for um, doing just one's own um, academic work, and it's it's a delight to be here. So thank you particularly to Edward <laughs> uh, for <laughs> inviting me here. Um, as you just heard, I'm, I'm currently writing a series of six lectures at um, this, this um, I think when I, when I was planning this one, I wanted to condense them all into one, uh, which was um, probably a mistake. Um, <laughs> but um, I, I, I won't do that, but um, if I'm uh, trying to cover too much, I hope at least the, the bits that I go over too rapidly will be um, provide an opportunity in the question and answer for you to take me up on. So here's, here's what I am um, planning. Um, I want to, first of all, introduce a, an ancient philosophical debate, um, and then I will say why I think this is so important for understanding life, focusing particularly on organisms, and then perhaps some of you might expect I would then move on to genes. I actually want to move in the other direction and talk about lineages or species um, and how they should be seen in a process way. Um, and then finally, for about the second half of the talk, I will try and explore some implications for humans. First, some general ideas about how we should think of the human species, and then some um, more specific implications for problems that are of more immediate practical concern, particularly concerning the classification of humans. So um, rather, rather a lot to cover, but I hope I will at least get a sense. Uh, and I guess my hope is that I will not only explain this philosophical view, but also give you some sense of why it might actually matter. Okay, so let me start off with the most general um, background to my work, the distinction between a substance, as philosophers like to call it, I prefer just to talk about things, um, and a process view of the world. This goes back to the dawn of Western philosophy, and I should perhaps say, when I say the dawn, I don't mean it's the dawn of philosophy, it's the dawn of the tradition of philosophy that I was brought up in, um, the starting with the Greeks. Uh, the Greeks, some of you will know, um, give a lot of credit for where they started to Egyptian philosophy that had been um, alive for about 2,000 years before this, but about which we know rather little, um, some of it being what the Greeks tell us. So these, um, on this slide, two of the better known pre-Socratic Greek philosophers and some rather um, conflicting um, views that they had. So on the one hand, we have Parmenides, who is famous for having said, change is an illusion. There is no change. Everything is basically just what it is and what it always was. And uh, Heraclitus, my personal hero, who said, nothing exists but change. So clearly some 
some contrasting views. Uh, now, the first thing I might say about Parmenides is that seems a silly view because we see things changing all the time. But there is a, a follower of his who created a view that makes some sense of this, and this is um, Democritus. Democritus, who I, could also, I should probably also mention, Leucippus, but he's much less well-known. Um, Democritus, a little while after Parmenides, introduced into Greek philosophy, or took from Leucippus, the idea that nothing um, except, there is nothing in the world except atoms and the void. Atoms don't change. So what the fundamentally is doesn't change. There's just a certain number of atoms. They just rearrange themselves into different shapes um, and form different things. So um, I, th this is, I think, a, a, a debate that has echoed through the tradition of philosophy as I learnt it. Um, and then I move on about best part of 2,000 years, so I'm not a historian, as you can see, um, to the scientific revolution. And what I basically want to say here is that Parmenides, broadly speaking, won at this point. The view of, of, of a world of atoms, unchanging atoms in the void, was accepted by uh, the emerging scientists in the 17th century. And here's a quote from one of the leading figures there, Robert Boyle, who said, the naturalist, that means a scientist, in explicating particular phenomena, phenomena considers only the size, shape, motion, or want of it, texture, and the resulting quantities and attributes of the small particles of matter. So if we want to understand how something works, what it does, we try and figure out how the atoms in it are arranged, because there, the reality, the rest is just, um, just a temporary pattern um, that, that is of no real scientific importance. And what I want to, or what underlies a whole lot of my work in recent years is the idea that Parmenides' victory here was actually a disaster for the future study of biology. And that's probably an exaggeration because you know, atomism has been very productive, it's given us genetics and all kinds of good things, but it's basically wrong and, and we're beginning, as it develops, to see ways in which it has led us to misunderstand um, some very fundamental things. So, let me just now try and explain roughly what is at stake. So, the Parmenidean, Democritian view has a world of things. There are atoms, and then there are these composites of atoms into these more um, complex things. There are various views about things, and I, again, just for philosophers, I mentioned the word substances, which is a more technical term. Um, substances also, there's no great agreement about what they are, um, and things is suitably vague, uh, and, and what I'm pointing to here is some very um, dominant themes in the way people have thought about uh, these constituents of the world. So the world is composed of things. These things have properties, again, all reducible to the atoms that compose them. And specifically, they have essential properties, properties that make them a particular kind of things. So other properties can change, but once the essential property no longer applies, the thing no longer exists. And this answers a question which was very fundamental to, uh, to this way of thinking as to how things what it was for things to persist. Um, things are thought of as autonomous. Uh, they're, theoretically, there might just be one atom in the universe and nothing else. Certainly, there might be just one table or one planet. These are the examples I've given. And these things also have reasonably firm boundaries, sharp boundaries. Not absolutely, but pretty much you know, you know where a table begins and where it ends. And finally, and this is particularly important, if, if in the default state of a thing is stasis. It doesn't do anything um, unless something makes it do something. So science is typically about explaining why things change, why they leave their static um, state. And so I, I have some examples there. Here's a, 
questionable example, and I want to explore whether that fits in this category of a thing. Now, process, which I've defined partly in opposition to this, is dynamic, always dynamic. And what we think of as things are eddies in this more fundamental flux of process, ever-changing, as Heraclitus told us. And in fact, it is their stability that, rather than their changes that require explanation. Remember the last slide, I actually had a picture of the planet Jupiter. I now have a close-up of the red spot, the great red spot on Jupiter, which is actually a kind of paradigm for me of a process. It's been there for at least 150 years, probably much longer, and it looks like you know a sort of thing on the surface of the planet, but actually it's a storm. It's a massive storm, and it's sustained by winds of about 600 kilometers an hour that go around it, and this process has kept it going um, for all this time. If the wind stopped, it would just dissipate. There would be no more spot. So its stability depends actually on its internal nature, but also on its surroundings. And partly for that reason, typically a process that has vague boundaries. Uh, you know, where does the wind stop and the spot end? There's really no good answer to that. So processes require activity for their continued existence, and that contrasts with the point about stasis. And again, we can ask whether organisms um, fit under this kind of general description, to which I now turn. So let me say something about it. Now, organisms have, in fact, since Aristotle, been a kind of paradigm example of complex contents of the world and have been defined broadly in terms of this um, set of views about substances. But there are at least three reasons why we should think of organisms as processes, and I'll just go briefly through these in a moment, but here I just list them. They're metabolic processes, developmental processes, and symbiotic systems, and I'll s explain what I mean by these. So let me start off. This is a very familiar view of, um, you know, idea about organisms. Scientists like to say they are thermodynamically open systems, far from equilibrium. You are not in equilibrium with your environment. You won't be until you've been dead for a while. And that's just, and in fact, there are, every second, there are actually trillions of little events inside you which maintain you in this disequilibrium state. So very far removed from this idea of a thing, the default of which is stasis. And they're also they are not autonomous. If they're not in an environment which provides them with air, water, food, they quickly cease to be stable structures um, and they are no more. So, um, so, so they're, they're not stable by default, far from it. Um, and secondly, organisms are developmental processes. Organisms have life cycles. They don't have any constant property that's even a candidate for being an essential property that defines their continued existence. So unless we want to say that, you know, the tadpole dies and a frog appears from somewhere, which is not how we normally think of it. We normally think of one organism that was once a tadpole and is now a frog, but these are very different. Um, like I said, larva and a beetle there, same example. Um, so really we need to identify the organism with this entire life cycle from um, a fertilized egg to death. And um, I think the way, and I won't go into this, but I'll just throw it out, the way one should think of organisms over time is through causal continuity, that one stage of the process causes the next stage rather than in terms of anything like stable continued properties, still less essences. Finally, and this is <coughs> actually the, um, the line of thought that led me into um, process thinking, uh, everywhere in life there is symbiosis. The stabilization of organisms 
is achieved by their internal processes, but also by cooperative relations with other organisms. And I give some examples. I mean, you probably know now that you have something like um, 10, about 10 to the 14, that's 1,000 trillion, quadrillion so that, um, my, symbiotic microbes associated with your body, many of which are essential for your well-being. Um, and you know, we can talk about the, the digestive system of a cow or an example I very much like. The plant roots, partly because, as we now know, people sometimes might have heard people talk about the wood wide web, that actually when you see a mushroom, you're not seeing an independent autonomous organism, you're seeing something that comes up of a web of mycelial fibers in the soil that actually connects many plants together, enables them to pass nutrients from one to the other. It's a massively cooperative thing. So I want to say few, if any, organisms are even close to being autonomous. So a final general point I want to make about um, processes is as the example of the, um, of, as, as the phenomenon of symbiosis shows, processes become entangled with one another. And in many cases, it's their entanglement that enables them to persist and carry on. And these examples that I've got on the slide are just to get a sense of the fact that processes are constantly changing their boundaries um, as they interact with their environment. And, and I, I like to come back to rivers, just in memory of Heraclitus, who famously probably didn't say, um, you never step in the same river twice, but everybody says he did. Um, and, and a river is a wonderful example, because a river is a process of water flowing down towards the sea. But if you look at a river, you know, where's a tributary? How wide does it have to be to become a lake? Where does the river end and the lake begin? Um, you know, and, and you can um, go on like this. It's very hard to say where the distinct things are. Okay. Now, as I said, after organisms, the other um, biological category that really interests me greatly are lineages. And I'll try and explain why those are so interesting. So the question that introduces lineage is the question, what evolves? And you know, we, we talk loosely about humans evolved, but no human has ever evolved. You will not evolve however long you live. Evolution is a phenomenon that happens at the level of series of, of organisms related in this ancestral descendant way, um, and evolution happens when the properties within the lineage change over time. So, as a matter of fact, um, I've, they've got a little picture of one of the founders of the, what's called the modern synthesis, still the sort of dominant view of evolution. This is J George Gaylord Simpson, and he defines a species. And, and I, let me just back up a moment. Um, there's a complex relationship between the concept of a lineage and a species. And as I know to the bottom, there are some the species can consist of several populations and um, species um, don't apply to all organisms. It's hard to define a species of bacteria. All of that's fairly irrelevant at the moment because I'm interested in moving towards humans. But also, I should say that, so for simplification, I'm just going to talk as if a species and a lineage are the same thing, or at least a lineage is composed of species. A lineage is a series of species, and you know, if one traces human origins back to some primordial slime, uh, mostly, most of the way, one's just got a series of species. So that's a very long lineage. Okay. Right. So um, what is a species? The most famous debate when I was first doing philosophy of biology for two, for about 20 years at any rate, was between people who thought, as many of you may well, um, that species is a, a classificatory term. And by the way, I think it is that too. But, um, but what these two people here, um, Michael Gieselin and David Howe, argued was that actually we should think of species as a kind of individual. And lots of people said, that's stupid. You can't have an individual where the parts, you know, some of them might be in 
Australia, and some of them might be in Europe, um, or you know, um, and many people thought this must be nonsense. Um, but on the whole, biologists accepted it because they thought of species in relation to the tree of life, the phylogenetic history of life, and species as little twigs at the end of this. And a twig is a thing, so it looks if a species is a thing. The, I think the solution to this um, sort of dilemma is to recognize that species are actually not a kind of thing, but a kind of process. And of course, you know, a lineage clearly doesn't exist unless it's doing something. A lineage exists by reproducing itself, um, by producing new members of the species and so on. So I think once you see that a lineage is a process, evolution is something that happens to these processes, a kind of change that happens within them, and of course it happens constantly in response to the environment with which they are deeply intertwined, as any biologist will now tell you, um, is I think a fairly straightforward way of seeing all this. Um, I said, introducing uh, processes, that you ask a somewhat different question. The question you tend to ask about a process is how it remains stable, how it exists, and of course, lineages have existed for billions of years. And what maintains this stability, either just for the species at a time, but over the whole sequence of species over geological or biological time. And this is something I would just throw out in passing. I think that the real most important thing about natural selection, and I think Darwin would not be totally opposed to this, is that they stabilize lineages by massive overproduction of offspring and then um, by um, selecting the ones that are fit to carry on the species. But that's another topic. Um, the more relevant species, you may have heard species defined as reproductively isolated groups of organisms. I think that species as we know them actually came into being with sexual reproduction, which enabled the isolation of a species, the coherence of a, of a lineage through time in a way that was not easily possible before, though that's a very complex um, argument. And finally, through cooperation. And that, I think, is the ultimate, most coherent, most organized form of a species. And the absolutely prime example of that is the human species. And that leads me on to the humans. And I just make a sort of, you know, this parenthesis to the, to the title of this section. I'm kind of interested in whether this is an argument for human exceptionalism. I do think humans are, I think people are afraid of saying humans are kind of unique and this is associated with all kinds of different things. But humans have taken certain evolutionary tendencies so far that, as one famous philosopher might have said, a difference of, kind, of degree has become a difference of kind. But I, all I want to say is, is that I think this is a lot to say about what's exceptional about humans, though perhaps not as much as some people might like. So let me start with humans with human development. And in particularly, particular, I want to emphasize developmental plasticity. Um, and this is something that is, all organisms have some degree of developmental plasticity, which again is, is um, a very processual idea, I think. Um, but I think that in terms of a particular dimension of plasticity, humans have taken this to a new degree. And in particular, I mean, behavioral plasticity. I like to think plants do physiological <laughs> plasticity more than anything else, and perhaps bacteria do chemical plasticity, which is why we still depend on them so much. But we do behavioral plasticity, which is the whole point of being an animal, I think. <laughs> and when we look at this, you see that certainly in the human case, and in other cases, there are many factors that affect this development of behavior. So of course, there are genetic differences, also epigenetics, which I, many of you will know about, I'll talk about that if anybody wants in the discussion, but I think that would be uh, difficult now. 
Um, the upbringing, your environment, has a great deal to do with your developmental trajectory. You may also affect it yourself by the way you behave, though that again is another topic which I'm happy to talk about, but I won't go into here. Um, but also the wider social and physical environment, which I'll mention in a moment, under a very important topic in recent biology, niche construction. But before that, I want to talk about, oh dear, sorry, I didn't think I'd done that. It's horrible, sorry. <laughs> so <laughs> if you look at human societies, perhaps the thing that is most unique about them is the division of labor. It's an absolutely decisive factor in contemporary human lineages. And of course, the division of labor that we have re requires remarkable developmental plasticity in behavioral capacities. You know, people come to be able to do all sorts of things, even weird things like standing up and, and showing you're talking about philosophy. <laughs> I mean, that's a very, very particular developmental trajectory. Um, I think, and, and this, this kind of anticipates the final parts of my talk, many political and social problems come about because we understand the division of labor in terms of different kinds of people, kinds of thing with different essential properties, workers, women, manual versus professional workers, etc., rather than different developmental histories. And I have a source for this which I, I really love um, in the history of, of actually British philosophy, uh, somebody, Adam Smith, who is sometimes thought of in very different ways. But here is, uh, Adam Smith is greatly maligned as he has been taken over by a political uh, interest that is not exactly mine. But here's something that Adam Smith says. The difference of natural talents in different men, sorry for the sex as he was in the 18th century, is in reality much less than we are aware of. And the very different genius which appears to distinguish men of different professions when grown up to maturity is not upon many occasions so much the cause as the effect of the division of labor. The difference between the most dissimilar characters, between a philosopher and a common street porter, for example, seems to arise not so much from nature as from habit, custom, and education. When they came into the world, and for the first six or eight years of their existence, they were perhaps very much alike, and neither their parents nor playfellows could perceive any remarkable difference. About that age, or soon after, they come to be employed in very different occupations. The difference of talents then comes to be taken notice of and widens by degrees, till at last the vanity of the philosopher is willing to acknowledge scarce any resemblance. Well, <laughs> I, uh, I will do my best to overcome this. But I think, um, I know, this is a perfect statement of developmental plasticity of a kind that we all too little understand. And I think the, uh, that it comes from this particular source is particularly wonderful. I will come back to this topic. But first I just want to briefly mention one other crucial factor in human lineages. Again, something that, that is very important in contemporary biology, niche construction. Every organism does this, they change their environment, and this is a really important fact in understanding evolution because we tend to talk as if evolving lineages just respond to an environment in a passive way, but of course it's a two-way process. They change their environments. And here's an extreme example at the top of beavers building dams and creating a whole different landscape. But none of this compares to what we do in creating our own environments which enable the ways we developed. And I just because as extreme examples of this are the existence of hospitals that obviously keep us alive and the existence of schools that enable us to come to fill these many roles in the complex division of labor. <coughs> so, so summarizing the unique features of the human species, we're a new, uniquely evolved in our behavioral plasticity, enabling the division of labor and the construction of complex niches. And in this regard, the other kind of arrivals probably are the social insects. And if they're fortunate, they're very small, or we'd be having terrible troubles with them, and we do sometimes anyway. But these, these features permit a unique sociality and social cohesion. And I think one of the things that, again, is very striking, and again, why I love to cite Adam Smith here, is that, that this is, makes so strange and 
ironic, the dominant ideology of individualism, of autonomous, separate individuals. No organism on the planet is more thoroughly dependent on conspecifics than we are. And just look at, look around you, look at what you're wearing, what you ate, you know, it's very obvious. But somehow, people somehow seem except I guess in, the, in COVID when we've discovered essential workers, but um, we've now forgotten that already, at least where I come from. Okay, so I, um, come, I move on to humankinds, and, and obviously this sets up the idea that humans are extremely diverse in their behaviors and lifestyles, and so there are multiple ways of dividing them into different kinds. Just leave, leave a few here. Um, the, Features that form the basis of these classifications have many causes, and there are many effects of having these features and being classified in these ways. And some people are familiar with um, Ian Hacking's work, who I believe has been here as a visitor, so some of you may even have heard him speak, who talks about the way that identifying people as a kind actually changes them in very fundamental ways. So I think we should be very suspicious of general claims about the implications of belonging to these human kinds. There is, as I sometimes say, diversity all the way down. Okay, so let me now talk very briefly, obviously because these are huge issues about the two perhaps most fundamental ways in which we tend to think of ourselves as divided into different kinds and start off with sex and gender. Now, of course, um, something that's very easy to understand as a process philosopher is that the sequence, the developmental sequence from, um, I, I've mentioned the, I don't think, no, I should use the genotypes, really the, the process perhaps begins more fundamentally at the identification at birth of belonging to one kind or the other, but at any rate, there's a, a long process to becoming a normatively gendered man or woman, and again, I think we're all quite familiar with this idea by now. And many factors contribute to stabilizing these typical trajectories towards these, um, these, these um, normative outcomes. So it includes genes, hormones, brains, parenting, the wider culture, and much else. There's a lot of variation along this trajectory, and therefore a diverse set of possible outcomes, which you know, are, are widely studied in... Um, many areas of the academy now. And I should say, I say sex gender, as I talk about, um, and I here follow the feminist biologist Anne Fausto Sterling, who's done, I think, the, the best work on the biology of sex and gender, as biological sex and normative gender do usually go together, but not always, and there's a huge diversity in the expression of gender. So, what I want to doubt, oh, sorry, that was supposed to come on in bits, but never mind. Um, I just wanted to give one little example of um, a kind of, you know, very simple element of the different environment. And I came across this lovely work by a Korean artist who looked at children and collected their toys, various ages, and she's got a bunch of these pictures and noted that you probably can see a difference. I'm sorry if there are um, people who are don't see color, but one's pink and one's blue in a very um, clear way. Um, and as I say, just, just to, as a nice example, and it's a nice example also because uh, it actually, um, some of you may well know, um, pink was considered a totally masculine color until about middle of the 20th century. And you can find advice telling people exactly the opposite, you know, give your boys pink things and give your blue, your kids, blue things. It also turns out that even in uh, cultures that are fully signed up to this, um, by the time you get to be about a teenager, everybody likes blue better, pretty much. But all of this is just to say, there's a totally arbitrary ways in which we have a different, these different trajectories. And I do notice that this can go on a bit longer. Um, I was rather <laughs> pleased to find this little picture of the uh, German Olympic team a few years ago, uh, which I'm has. Um, <laughs> okay, so here's obviously getting back to my theme. Um, so descriptions of gender difference between boys and girls, men and women, are, are typically understood or quite widely understood as describing different kinds of things, probably not an audience as sophisticated as here, but 
you know, in the wider public and you know, even the best-selling book of a decade was this one, Men Are From Mars, Women Are From Venus, saying what very different kinds of things these were. Um, but of course, what we really see in these stereotypes are just snapshots of a particular stage in a very contingent and highly variable process of gender differentiation. And I think this is a really important misunderstanding um, and one that I think is really stems from some very deep philosophical misunderstandings of what the world is like. And, and this, of course, is science is not above all this. And here's a little thing I came across a few years ago, which is an announcement in The Guardian, which I rather liked, and we've all, all seen pictures like this. So it says, Regina, Regina Verma, a researcher at the University of Pennsylvania, said the greatest surprise was how much the findings supported old stereotypes, with men's brains apparently wired more for perception and coordinated actions than women's for social skills and memory, making them better equipped for multitasking. So I guess science shows it is just different kinds of things with different essential properties. And I, I really have just one comment on this. Why do you assume the wiring of the brain is a cause rather than effect of gender difference? There are all these differences going in. So what a surprise that you find differently wired brains at the end of it. I mean, it's just, and, and so the interesting thing is how people come to think that this is a reasonable and obvious interpretation of this data. And I think the answer is because we have a framework in which we think. And here I have to be very quick because it's a rather complicated slide in the end, but I'll just, I think the picture is we have a lot of, um, you know, th there's something I haven't talked about, but which I have thought about a lot. We have these evolutionary stories about how um, males and females become sent down different channels and they do this by getting specific genes that make their brains different and make the behavior come out. Um, in particular ways. And again, I would just be really quick with all this mess I want to add on. Um, and I was going to say, you know, all of these things are, are subject to many other influences, environmental um, influences of various kinds. And I think even more interestingly, it's the linearity. There's no, uh, the, the upward arrows are just as important as the downward arrows. And so, of course, when I say gender-specific behavior causes sexually differentiated brains, I mean, how the, the two processes balance is hard to say precisely, but certainly that is going to happen. And so, um, so I say the model somehow marginalizes environmental influences. It just talks about the internal nature of this thing that's undergoing this emergence. And, um, and I say all of these, the, and, and again, as this is hopelessly linear, whereas actual causal patterns in biology are just not like that. Everything tends to go both ways, which is, you know, makes life very difficult, but it's just how it is. Okay, so now I get on to um, my last topic and just say something very little, I should say, because obviously there's a lot going on here. But what I want to look at is, again, ways in which this biological picture, this kind of which I ultimately I call a philosophical picture, affects the way people understand the world. And I would say sometimes in a quite detrimental way. So here's a quote from a journalist, but a pretty respected one. He's been a correspondent for um, science and nature and you know, some, some reputable. Um, so he says, analysis of genomes from around the world established that there is a biological basis for race, despite the official statements to the contrary of leading social science organizations. And many of you will know, social scientists and humanists have on the whole said, race is a social construction. Now, of course, this, it's complicated here because social constructions are not unreal, but <laughs> when we talk about real, we tend to be in this context we're talking about. But is it something biologically out there? Really meaning, is it something we couldn't do anything differently with because it's out there in the genes or something? So um, an illustration of this point is the fact that with mixed race populations, such as African-Americans, geneticists can now track along an individual's genome and assign each segment to an African or European ancestor, an exercise that would be impossible if race did not have some basis in biological reality. I'll come back to this quote in a moment, but first I want to just say this, something about where this comes from. 
So here's a, there's a typical um, piece of scientific work. This is a classic example from 2002 um, where um, a number of, of researchers took genome, gen material, biological material from a lot of people, about a thousand people from various parts of the world, and they used a program to analyze this program called structure. And what you do with structure is you say, cluster this into three groups, and it comes out with some set of clusters. And in fact, if you put n equals four, you will say four groups, you come out more or less with Africans, Asians, Europeans, and Native Americans. And then you add five, and Oceania splits off from Asia, and that's maybe one where you want to see it. Here's a picture from the paper, and that, what I just want to say, where does this come from? Well, basically what you're mapping here is the history of certain major human migrations. So as we all know, um, we all came out of Africa, we don't know exactly how long ago, um, but actually, you know, most of us, of course, didn't. A few of us came out of Africa and then spread gradually around the globe. And because the genome is a part of a dynamic process, perhaps a dynamic process in itself, the longer it goes on, the more changes it accumulates. Actually, this study is looking at specifically at non-functional bits of the genome um, because those are the ones that you can see just drifting. And they actually drift quite a bit. And the longer you've been separated from another distant population, the further they drift. So it's not too surprising that it's not actually unambiguous, though later programs are a bit more reliable. But generally, you first of all, you get Africa and essentially the rest, though that tends to be focused on the Americas because they're furthest away. And then you split off either Eurasia or um, Southeast Asia, uh, either Eurasia from Africa or Southeast Asia from the Americas. Uh, they can go in either direction, depending how many times you run the program. Um, and then you get Oceania, and then it all falls apart. Actually, the next one you get on this piece of work was the Kailash people of northwest Pakistan, numbering about 4,000. Um, so that's just um, an, an anomaly. But so you might think, okay, here's, um, here's scientific evidence that you can sort of look at a genome and you can tell which race somebody belongs to. Well, of course, the first thing is to say what you're finding out about is, um, is historical origin, something about where your ancestors lived in the past. And the second thing, I mean, is that this is, is such a partial picture. People move around all the time. And one way of saying this, of, 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 that I actually just was thinking about today when I was trying to figure out how to say, explain something so complicated, is one thing we all know is actually most of the human genetic diversity is in Africa, in sub-Saharan Africa, because actually only a very small population or possibly a series of small populations left Africa. Now that has various consequences because it's a small population. Actually, that's well known to geneticists, means you get a lot of drift. And so in these particular kind of um, non-functional markers, you get a lot of change and it becomes quite easy to, um, to, to track these histories. Of course, there are backward migrations. People are moving backwards and forwards all the time, so things are getting quite complicated. I also was curious, nothing happens inside Africa. That's just um, something. Um, actually, if you look up recently, one reason for that is until recently, nobody had done much of this kind of genetics, but nowadays they will say there are probably 13 ancestral populations in Africa, mostly they are pretty mixed up, so it's quite hard to, to track down where everybody came from, but some of them are quite separated, and of course there are um, still places where they come into, um, you know, un, into quite hostile relations with one another, as um, unfortunately. So I guess what I'm saying is, is we're looking at something quite different, we're looking at this this, this process of, diff of groups of people moving around, we're tracking those movements, and then we are reifying them into different kinds of people. 
And uh, this is, again, I think, something that happens. Reification is a word that I like a lot, obviously. <laughs> this is the process of, of looking at a temporally stable bit of a process and thinking it's a kind of thing. So where does this leave us? And, and I should say that actually Rosenberg says here something which famously was um, said by Richard Lewintin, um, uh, the very world-famous geneticist in about the 1970s, who did the first study of this kind, and he said, the average proportion of genetic differences between individuals from different human populations only slightly exceeds that between unrelated individuals from a single population. So that's to say, sorting people according to what you think of as their race tells you only a very little bit about their genetic differences. And that little bit is, as I say, more or less what they've accumulated in their travels. So our race is real. And again, obviously what I mean here, in the sense that people want to say it's a biological reality. What I want to say is the residue of ancestral origin. Humans travel a lot, sometimes lots of them carrying genetic markers. These migratory populations are transitory lineages within the the overall human lineages. Generally, migratory populations merge into the wider population fairly rapidly, so they're not identifiable. I um, believe that my name comes from a Huguenot ancestor. Lots of Huguenots left France in 1700, and some of them, I believe, live up the road in Franschhoek. <laughs> um, um, but on the whole, it's very hard to find them. You could, probably could, if you really wanted to, find some genetic markers that would confirm, or not confirm, that somewhere I had a Huguenot ancestor. Why you would want to do that, I don't know. But anyhow. <laughs> but here's the, the, I think, the interesting thing, or the, um, some way interesting, that what would make these flows of people um, maintain a coherence as lineages is barriers to integration particularly to reproduction. And uh, this will slow down integration and stabilize the sublineage at a certain time. And this will allow systematic differences in the way people are treated, the, the opportunities they have, and so on, and hence differences in behavior. And I think this is the sense in which it is absolutely true to say that racism causes race rather than vice versa. The racism stabilizes lineages of migratory peoples in ways that enables them to be identifiable as continuing entities and tempts people to think that we've got fundamentally different kinds of people. So biological race, I say, is the static frozen legacy of this historical process of migration. And of course, I should add, none of this makes it as if we all understood that we would immediately abolish racial distinctions the week after next. But um, I, I think that perhaps in the next century we might aim to do this. Let me just come back to this quote I started with, this bit of discussion, and, and just at the end of it. So um, I, um, a geneticists can now track along an individual's genome and assign each segment to an African or European ancestor. Now, how bizarre is that? I mean, genomes are inherited. You pass them down. If you have a European ancestor and an African ancestor, there's probably bits of your genome that you inherited from each of those ancestors. And for the reasons I've briefly described, there are probably things in the genome that will enable you to identify them. So, I mean, there are huge complexities. So how big is, um, is a segment? Because if you go down to small enough segments, then you can't, certainly can't identify them. You might have to get quite a big segment to identify it, but they all came from whatever ancestors you had. So it says, an exercise that would be impossible if race did not have some basis in biological reality. That seems to me a blinding non sequitur. It just says, if, if you didn't have ancestors, then you couldn't have markers in your genome saying which of them you were responsible for different little features of your genome. So. Um, I think we can, I hope that that is clear how, again, um, you know, and, and I, I, I leave it as an exercise for the listener to work out why I think this is, is a kind of reification and, 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 and becomes much 
easier to see through in a process world. So um, I should say, um, Wade does say some rather unfortunate things in this article that I say, but he also says the overwhelming verdict of the genome is to declare the basic unity of humankind, so perhaps we should forgive him for some of the things he says along the way. Um, so really what we, I think, um, have in a way is where races survive as easily identifiable sub-parts of the population, we really have cultural kinds rather than biological kinds. And cultural kinds, I think, are something really interesting that certainly happens um, because we, you know, we classify people in all kinds of ways, mostly not thinking that we're doing biology, but these can ground lineages. It could have been that the Huguenots all stuck together and, and made the things that Huguenots make, and, and we could contribute little bits of Huguenot culture to the world, which I'm sure we did in the, if I, <laughs> in the past. Um, but um, as with races, whether these... these sub-processes persist essentially depends on how, how strong the barriers are between them and the rest of the world. And it may well be that some of these barriers are good things. I mean, they enable these cultures to persist and produce different unique things. Um, certainly prior to globalizations, I think many national identities formed fairly robust cultural lineages. And I don't mean to make this sound as if I'm a big fan of contemporary nationalism, but perhaps this is you know, the best that you can say for what some of these um, people are doing. Now, I want to end with a rather curious question um, because I think cultural kinds are interesting. And it occurred to me while I was doing this that well, cultural kinds I mean, can actually direct, to some degree, their own evolution. You know, we can have the Council of Huguenots who come together and say, we're going to be really nice. You know, we're going to um, do great things. And we could become the nicest people in the world because we all said we're going to live by this wonderful code. Um, might not happen, might not work, but at any rate, it's something that um, we can, to some degree, direct the evolution of a cultural kind. And I saw the question, well, can, could the human species become a cultural kind in this end and direct its own evolution? And you may not be surprised at the thing that put this in mind. Um, I, I spoke of niche construction. Construction here is a rather neutral term. I mean, all organisms affect their environment. We are now famously engaged in a catastrophic process of niche destruction, which may well um, actually wipe us off the planet in the not very distant future. It would be a good idea if we could think of ourselves as a lineage and somehow direct that lineage um, in a way that might possibly forestall this outcome. And with that thought, I was reminded of a rather lovely bit of process lineage thinking that I came across actually from Native American philosophy, and I will read this because I like it very much. If you ask me what is the most important thing that I've learned about being a Haudenosaunee, it's the idea that we are connected to a community, but a community that transcends time. We're connected to the first Indians who walked on this earth, the very first ones, however long ago that was. But we're also connected to those Indians who aren't even born yet, who are going to walk this earth. And our job in the middle is to bridge that gap. You take the inheritance from the past, you add to it your ideas and your thinking, and you bundle it up and shoot it to the future. You come here to work hard so that the future can enjoy that benefit. And it seemed to me this is actually precisely how we should think about a lineage that we're part of, whether we could come to think about that of the big lineage, I don't know, but it's a nice thought. So I will conclude, humans have a place in both a complexly differentiated biological lineage and one or more cultural lineage, lineages. Much diversity is to be interpreted in relate, relation to location in such lineages rather than merely a species-wide individual variation. But all of these lineages contain much internal variation, and only when they, whether 
biological or cultural are unusually isolated from the majority of the human population, at least the population that surrounds them, does lineage membership have much predictive value for properties of individuals? And surely such isolation is now commoner for cultural lineages and end really pathetically, I thought, maybe this highlights the dangers of social media bubbles. And that really is my pathetic end. <laughs> So you can take, take questions? Sorry about that. Thank you. Thank you, John, very much for that wonderful list. Uh, take questions from the floor here. Let me just, before we do that, say a word of welcome to all those who joined us online. I've seen several fellows, so thank you. Thank you so much for, for joining us today. Um, unfortunately, those online, we can't uh, uh, show you. So if any of those online have questions, please put them in the chat. We'll make sure that John gets your comments and questions afterwards. Uh, so we'll take questions from the floor. I think I saw Magnus's hand up first, uh, and Eric next. Hello. Uh, thank you so much for a very interesting uh, lecture and thought-provoking, I think, especially the first part. Uh, in the very beginning, you mentioned that thinking of organisms as things instead of processes had been... I think you used the word disastrous uh, for, for biology. Could you explain a little bit how you think it would have been different if it would be thought of as a process? Right. That's, um, thank you very much for that um, very challenging question. <laughs> yes. Um, of course, it's <laughs> the, the evasive answer is, of course, I don't know. Um, and surely it would have been better to get it right. Um, I think what, what actually, I, I sort of have a story, and look, I mean, one thing, I think I sort of said that in a little under my breath at some point. Perhaps I didn't. I do think that um, thing thinking has been remarkably productive. But here's, here's a history of biology for the last 100 years. In the first half of the 20th century, there were a lot of process biologists. I mean, um, my favorite is um, C.H. Waddington who was a big fan of, of, um, of Whitehead, the great process philosopher of the uh, first part of, the, of, the, of that period. Um, and I think there was a lot of very interesting thinking about biology. And then in 1953, just to put an arbitrary date on it, we have the discovery of the structure of DNA. And we have a period of enormously productive, reductive biology which is basically um, the kind that I don't like, but I have to admit, it was enormously productive. What I think we are coming to is a point at which the, I don't mean that you know, we should get rid of genetics, but genetics is dominating biology in ways that are really limiting. And we need to be able to get back to um, whole organism biology um, to even, you know, kind of um, even whole lineage biology in ways that um, we tend not to because everybody has been sort of pushed towards doing um, genetics. And genetics is a perspective. My general view, actually I guess I, in one context I might go into, is that we have a, we have a hierarchy more or less, very roughly, of abstractions that we use to do biology, you know, I mean, like, let's say molecules, cells, organs, organisms, you know, higher up groups. And really to understand life, we have to look at all of these and the ways they condition one another. So if I want to look at my heart, it's really helpful to look at the way the molecule, molecular processes in my heart work and maybe respond to, you know, my, to, to, to the chemical influxes. But it's also good to know that I probably should go and take some exercise um, and what I eat. And of course, this is actually whole organism biology. It's looking at the organism as a whole, and my heart depends on my body just as my body depends on my heart. And I think it's sort of like this all the way down, and sometimes we look so much bottom up that we don't take sufficient note of the top down. That 
Thank you, Magnus. By the way, we'll, we'll ask uh, all those with questions to use the microphone for the sake of our online audience. So Iris was next. Thank you for um, this thought-provoking uh, talk. And I guess I want to invite you to go back to human exceptionalism. So I wasn't convinced. Uh, I think you kind of um, uh, set it up as, uh, uh, well, maybe you didn't say competition versus cooperation. But um, I'm wondering, I mean, I'm wondering about the bifurcation of, generally, of, of these, uh, um, the re reification of these bifurcations, which, uh, you know, change versus uh, static, you know, movement versus, um, uh, so, so it's all kind of bifurcated and seems to go against um, the essential idea underlying process, isn't it, that both of them exist, not what just th th both. That both um, processes and things exist. Right, mm -hmm. number one. I, but I guess that wasn't really my question. I want to go back to the human exceptionalism aspect because mm -hmm. I, I don't understand um, why social insects uh, are, not, um, are not part of the discussion. I mean, it's okay to decide to focus on humans for this, but I don't, I feel like there's political implications in that and climate change being one of them and just anthropomorphism um, being so great. Anyway, um, so that's kind of the central aspect of my question and I guess related to that is uh, that you still seem to use the terms species and lineage, which seem to be such so strongly um, situated in some of the th thought that you oppose in process biology. I, I guess I'm wondering why you use the term species and lineage, which is so seems to be so linear even if even uh, linguistically. So I know I'm just pro probably saying a lot of disconnected things. So whatever, whatever you want to um, respond to, go for it. Well, let me try and work backwards and see if I get there. So species and lineages, I think these are um, uh, important concepts. Um, I mean, I, I have all kinds of um, issues with some of the way that they're used, but that's what we do, you know, philosophy, you know. We <laughs> we're interested in things because we want to. Uh, but but, but um, so I'm not quite sure what the question is there. I mean... Obviously, there are ways of understanding species that I'm very much opposed to, but that there is a coherent process, which is, say, the human species, doesn't seem to me a problem. Now, of course, it's not a, an autonomous process. It depends massively on vast numbers of other species, including symbionts, but also things we eat and so on. I mean, so it's not, a, it's not an autonomous process, but... There are very, there's what, that's the point of it being a process. They're not autonomous things. Um, the question about um, ants, I mean, I, I'm not sure quite what's at stake there. I mean, ants do not have the flexible developmental um, plasticity that we have. Um, How do I know? Um, I'm not sure. I mean, that seems to. I mean, I guess it's um, is true. There may be philosopher ants holding forth, um, giving lectures, and um, shoemaker ants making little. I, I, I'm 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 not sure how. They have division of labor, sure, but nobody. I mean, sometimes you'll see distinctions up for maybe seven or eight roles in some ant colonies, which is fantastic, but is nowhere even in orders of magnitude close to the sorts of diversity of... of um, and I, I guess it just seems to me a different model of social organization. Um, now, I, I might be um, wrong, might be... But, but ants don't have... Um, don't have brains as complicated as ours, for sure, which seems to suggest they may have less developmental plasticity. Um, but I, 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 well, we can, we can. And then, then there was a question about, um, or maybe that, maybe that, maybe we come back to that. You want to ask? Yeah. Okay. I, can I ask a question related? So, 
So we've got about five other hands. I'll, I'll, we'll get to, to, to yours. So next up, so Zimbi, right over here. Uh, thank you for a very interesting talk. Um, I don't want to put value judg judgments on you, but you said, um, so I, I imagine you, you think that individual diversity is a net positive, at least in many ways. Would you extend that to cultural diversity? Are there potentially positive outcomes of having more variation above the level of the individual as well? Yes. Simple answer. <laughs> yes. Um, I mean, I would, but obviously with a big caveat that it's obviously <coughs> extremely hazardous too, so we have to get better at dealing with cultural diversity. Um, but, um, I mean, how, I, I, the, the, the thing, I suppose the thing is that I put, that, that it may be that I, I would put more value than that than to individual diversity. I think we overvalue individual diversity. Um, I mean, in ways that needs at least to be qualified by a bit more of a recognition of our, um, our social context our basic uh, massive interdependence. So, um, but, but, but I think that these are, I, uh, to be honest, I'm, I don't have a very fixed a view about the normativity <laughs> here. Um, though certainly I, I probably have some um, half-baked views about it, but. Thank you. Uh, next up was Glenn. Uh, Thanks for a, oh sorry. Uh, thanks for a very um, interesting uh, and thought-provoking lecture. My, I have a, a, two questions. You can answer whatever one you want or neither. Um, the first one is uh, I would like to hear a little bit more about how you uh, see these ideas uh, relating to uh, uh, evolutionary psychology, uh, and particularly maybe uh, personality kinds of understanding of, of people. Um, and then the other question has to do with the characterization of um, the connections that uh, constitute the connection of processes or the connection, the symbiotic connections that constitute an individual or what we think of as an individual, human individual in particular. And I think those, uh, you, you referred to them as entanglements at yeah. one point. Yeah. Uh, and I was just wondering about the language that one uses for those connections. So the connections between symbionts and ourselves. Yeah, or, or yeah. whatever connections it is that constitute that thing that uh, psychologists and people in general perceive as an autonomous, bounded, separate, uh, independent source of action uh, and, and subjectivity. So how, uh, how to think about those um, things. I would call them like affordances maybe or affordances and constraints or something. But the reason I ask is uh, a lot of the words that we come up with to use them seem like a constraint on autonomy. Maybe that's just a hang up for a human being uh, structured in the way that, that we're structured in the kind of uh, enlightenment context that we inhabit. But um, what's a way of thinking about that that, that I, I presumably it's not just constraining but it's also empowering. It makes people, makes the, the process does important things. It just doesn't hold back some uh, authentically, inherently autonomous okay. thing. Okay. Um, on the second question, I think as you were speaking, I realized that I probably um, conveyed something I didn't quite want to convey. So um, the, I, I don't want to say very strongly that the symbiotic nature of humans particularly affects their autonomy. Um, I think it affects more the, 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 the ontology. I mean, I think it, it, it's, it's, there's a really interesting question, at least to me, about you know, what constitutes a human, what are the boundaries, is it the skin or is it the layer of uh, microbes that live on the skin, are they part of me or are they? But, but I don't think that they're contesting my autonomy exactly, though, you know, it, it, it's, a, it's a kind of reflection on how I, you know, might relate more um, fundamentally to the world around me than I often think I do. But where I was talking about autonomy was much more in the sociality. So the, the, the question of, of reconciling our notions of individual with the 
the you know really spectacularly cooperative nature of human society. I mean, you know, how put it in really you know kind of provocative um, kind of rabble rousing terms. I mean, how does anybody think that they have somehow earned you know a hundred billion dollars by you know by their little contribution to humanity when their contribution is 99.999% provided by other people, not to mention all the people who did all the invention of the stuff that they struck, stuck their little brick on the end of. Um, I, just evolutionary psychology, I'll be very quick about that. You, I'm sure you know we often distinguish evolutionary psychology with a small and a large, with capitals and small letters. So ev evolutionary psychology with small letters, we evolved, our psychology evolved, obviously I have no problem with. Evolutionary psychology with capital letters, meaning roughly that we evolved in the Stone Age to do what it takes to, you know, bash people over the head with clubs and carry off their, you know, stuff, or whatever, um, I think is... Um, garbage. I mean, I think it's really a totally misguided project. I think it's it's um, a hopelessly simplistic view of human evolution. Just to be very, you know, kind of un um, <laughs> dogmatic about it. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Glenn. We had Sharon next. Thanks, John. This is really, where do I hold it here? <laughs> All right, um, I have two questions, and um, both of them uh, go back to um, how, your, how you read Heraclitus and think with Heraclitus, about think with Heraclitus. Okay, so the first has to do with the sort of apology you began with about using the term Western, Western philosophy, and uh, in thinking about you know dawn of Greece and all, dawn of philosophy in Greece, and how you end with that uh, gesture to the Native American philo philosopher thinker, mm -hmm. as a philosopher presumably, how does that you know how, I just want to give you a chance to flesh that out in a Heraclitan way. That's one 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 question, sort of the, you know Western philosophy and the and the Native American philosophy in the same frame, since uh, yeah. Uh, since since Heraclitus is sort of conscripted into something called Western philosophy, right, uh, pre-Socratic. So then the second question is uh, is in that conscription and formation of a thing called Western philosophy and philosophy of biology within that. What exactly is your um, take on evolutionism and on developmentalism? Because you use both the words, the, ca the categories, evolution and developmental process as if they're, you know, uh, transparent. And of course they're not. And of course there's process thinking and there's process thinking. There are many ways in which Heraclitus is conscripted. And, uh, and I've, I mentioned this, that this is wonderful argument by David Graeber, this anarchist anthropologist, that Heraclitus thought you can read Heraclitus through a variety of radical traditions. And that's what his argument is. Yeah, I'm just wondering why, why, you know, what is the tension between evolutionism, developmentalism, and and uh, I think it's alluded to in your abstract on chaotic, on think on thinking uh, through chaos. So I, I wanted you to give you an um, opportunity to talk about that a bit. I mean, look, one thing I have to say first. I I did say in a what might have sounded an offhand way. I'm not a historian. Uh, <laughs> Um, it may be obvious. Uh, um, so, um, my invocation of Heraclitus is um, just kind of a more or less a mnemonic or something. I don't know what. I mean, it's it's or just a a, a reference that um, you know people will perhaps will or will not pick up as as. Um, I, I want to say this is um, a, a debate that goes back a long way. Of course, having said that, if I were a historian, I would then say, but of course it wasn't the same debate all along, that um, it's just a, an, a reification probably of, 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 a, of an ancient debate. And 
I think I'd probably say something similar about the the cross culture. I mean, I wish I knew more traditions of philosophy. I've talked to um, a an expert on Indian philosophy who once gave me a lot of of fascinating um, insights, which I fear I probably lost into process traditions in the Indian tradition. I know that you know. I think it's probably weakest in the Western tradition. <laughs> I mean, I think that 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 probably, w to the extent that I know of other philosophical traditions, they tend to be more process oriented than Western philosophy, in which has become a very minority view. And that, of course, is where I am. That's an excuse to. Um, argue it would be one strategy would be certainly to recruit people from <laughs> you know as collaborators from other traditions um, I guess you know and again just probably um, failing to live by my um, my own philosophical findings I may be at that level not a sufficiently collaborative philosopher uh, I mean um, I would um, it would be um, a great thing, but of course to do that, to respect those people I collaborate, I would have to spend a lot of time learning more about their philosophical traditions. And I don't know, maybe I'm too old or maybe I'll do it in my retirement. And, um, but but I, I, that's not, I don't know that's much of an answer. Um, evolution and development, well I mean there's a very simple glib answer to that. I mean evolution is what lineages do, development is what organisms do. Um, I'm not sure when you said evolutionism and developmentalism. Of course. I mean, I guess again, I, I mean, I, I keep feeling, I feel I'm doing much too much. Um, falling back on my own little, um, <laughs> little, little particular areas of expertise. But I, I guess I have to say what I'm primarily engaging with is as a philosopher of science with, with contemporary science. I mean, that's sort of my job. Now, that doesn't mean that excuses me to being ignorant of other things that are relevant to my job, um, but, but that's what I'm talking about. That's why I can say evolution and development are quite different things. Now, I mean, there are, there are interesting, you know, all kinds of interesting ways one can spell out that distinction. In fact, I, I'm a great fan of, I mentioned Waddington, he has a wonderful distinction between the homeostatic and the homeoretic, where homeostatic is just maintaining stability, homeoretic is following a pathway. Development is somewhat homeoretic, evolution is um, only homeostatic in the sense that the lineages are stable, but they have no goal. So that bring you know so there's something teleology about de teleological about development, which is explicitly lacking from um, evolutionary thinking as I understand it. So I mean there are there are there are some f big differences between these concepts as I use them, but there are certainly um, you know archaeologies that would take me a long time to go into, and I don't know that it would really help what I'm doing, um, but. I could be persuaded otherwise, perhaps. Thank you, Sharon. So we're uh, short of time. There were several more hands, so I'm going to abuse my position and just t uh, pick three among those. So Sean, Tanya, and then right at the back, uh, we'll take those three. And then all the other questions, please don't hesitate to uh, approach John afterwards. Uh, we can have further conversations then. So Sean, uh, please go ahead. Okay. Um, thank you, and thank you for the thought-provoking session. Um, my question, it, uh, to me it sounded easy. Uh, my friend asked me this question, but since then I've now been able to provide an answer that seemed uh, simple. So a bit of a background, my friend is studying plants, I think uh, plant physiology. So one day he says to me, um, Jimmy, if we, if human beings were to appreciate and understand evolution, there will be less social conflict. 
I think we're seeing this from the background of dealing with plants and how plants do all these life processes, both external and internal. However, when um, he brought this question to me about human beings, I had different and very conflicting answers. I would like to hear from you. Um, do you really, what do you think about it? Um, would there be less social conflict if we appreciated and understood uh, the concept of evolution? Uh, interesting, yes. Um, I mean, I, um, I guess um, I do tend to think understanding is a good thing and we would have, on the whole, understanding more things um, makes people um, less likely to do really stupid things, though that's probably a very optimistic view. Um, I think that, so I'm not, I, I'm honestly not sure. What I do think is that um, understanding evolution is better for socially than misunderstanding evolution. I think there's a lot of ways in which evolution is misunderstood, and I guess I could just, since I've already expressed my view on evolutionary psychology, I could um, <laughs> come to that. Lots of people think because they understand evolution, they understand you know, things like why men are from Mars and women are from Venus, because it's just different evolutionary pressures in the Stone Age. And it'd be better not to understand evolution at all than to misunderstand it like that. Um, but I think, um, on the whole, I think, um, yeah, I think evolution, you know, does, if properly understood, give us a very good insight into the general, um, as I think one of the scientists I quoted said, the unity of humankind, which will be a good thing for people to appreciate and possibly act on. So I'm not, I'm not terribly optimistic <laughs> that it would be a... Um, a great um, advance, um, but I think understanding is good and there are ways in which understanding evolution ought to make people um, think in better ways. So that's a, <laughs> I'm not sure I have a very good answer to that question. <laughs> Thanks so much. Uh, Sean. Thank you, John. We're running out of time, so if we um, want to just talk about this over drinks, I'm happy to do so. But I guess um, starting, uh, seeing maybe um, differently the kind of start with the two philosophers at the beginning is kind of a, a narrative lead in to this uh, problem. But, you know, it seems to me, okay, it's like, okay, there's two philosophers and it could have gone either way, but we went with thing rather than process. It seems to be, you know, is it just that, that, you know, these are the philosophical basis of science and this is how we were brought up, you know, uh, so it's, this is an effect rather than a cause um, of, of a kind of philosophical um, uh, contingency back in the day? Or is there something about our nature that makes us like to think in things rather than processes. And that could be a number of different, you know, so, so a lot of people have asked questions of why do you still use the, the word lineage, which sounds like a noun and a thing. Um, but, but actually that, 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 that could also just be a function of the way the language works, you know, based on nouns, etc. So is, I think it would be very hard, I'm sure I've read a sci-fi novel or something that, you know, tries to say, I'm not a human, I'm a humaning, or, you know, um, so that tries to change the language that everything is a process, and it just is really quite clumsy. Um, so, so I, I guess, w what are your thoughts on why um, we tend towards thing thinking? I think, I think that's a great question, and, and I worry about it a lot. I do certainly... I uh, think it, it's, it may well be that we do more naturally think in terms of things. Um, it, it's, it's, as I said, something that keeps coming up in my thinking, certainly, and I don't have a very good answer to it. Um, I, I, I would say it's not exactly the narrative I want to tell, because, again, I would say the narrative I want to tell is more the scientific one, which is to say... So, so the, in a way, the point of, of, of you know... Parmenides and Heraclitus at the beginning is just to say here is a set of concepts that absolutely guided um, what we, the, the way science developed 
and just go back and, and you know, in a rather histor historically responsible way, as I think <laughs> in an earlier question, and say there was a completely different framework which we could have taken, which would have, would have um, taken us in some quite different directions. So that's more, but, but I, I think, um, so, so, you know, and science isn't forced to take the way that we naturally think, though maybe, as a matter of fact, it's very much likely to do so. I do think we tend to think in, in thing ways, um, and, you know, I'm, I'm sometimes um, sort of appalled to realize how often I say something or nothing or everything or, um, you know, things ain't what they used to be, whatever. I mean, that, that just, you know, we talk, thing is, is just a word that we come to so naturally. But, but I, I, I guess the hypothesis is, yes, it comes to us naturally, but it carries sort of rather secret philosophical baggage that we at least need to expose and be more aware of than we are so we don't kind of carry it in serious, um, you know, really effective ways into how we think about certain topics. Thank you, Sean. And then Tanya. Tanya. Thank you, John. Um, you, you know, this might be too off topic, so you can tell me if you think it's, you know, it's a too off topic. But I was just wondering a little bit about the metaphysics behind the, the thinking, the process of thinking. So um, do you have any, any ideas of, of the mechanism that might be involved? So at one stage you said something along the lines of lineages that, that tend towards stabilization in, um, they kind of stabilize in the form of organisms or something along those lines. And I was just wondering, uh, do you have any ideas as to kind of the driving process behind that or, or not really? So, so um, metaphysically speaking, why does this process occur? How do genes, for example, fit into, um, I suppose, what's the teleology? Why well, do you have any ideas as to why well, the process? Well, I'm not sure about the teleology, though I'm, I'm very interested in how much teleology there should be in this. But I guess um, perhaps one way I could, I could say it is, is, is um, I, I've, I'm not always entirely, a, always a fan of Richard Dawkins' view of evolution, but I think he did had one really clever thing said in, in his um, you know, famous Selfish G book, the whole, which is the phrase "the survival of the stable," which seems to me much better than the survival of the fittest. And so, I, what I think of, I mean, and, and here right back into, you know, early cosmology, is what appeals to me as a view of the universe is a view of chaos in which things emerge or what we call things but stabilized aspects of the chaos for various reasons that we explore so um, so it's all I mean you know in that sense natural selection is from the very start um, and you know there, there are matter has the ability to form stable structures and eventually, they, they in a kind of cumulative way, we get more complex structures. Lineages are, you know, a very late part of that process. Um, but they, but you know, at the core, when I said natural selection, I did kind of allude to in passing. I think the really important thing about natural selection is that it stabilizes lineages. That that's why we have stable lineages. Um, because that's what it takes to for them to um, survive. So rather than unless will be where I, where where my, where I go away from Richard Dawkins, I'm not sure it's very helpful to think of natural selection as a creative process, but as a stabilizing process. I think it's impossible to overestimate how important it is. Is that did I did I stay on yeah, sure, topics or topic? I think everything is just contingent. Yes. I mean, that's, <laughs> sadly, that's my, um, I mean, I kind of like it. I, I like to live in a very contingent universe, but, um, but it's not everyone's taste, perhaps. But yes, I do, I just think it's. Contingent. Thank you, thank you, John. That takes us back to where you started. Everything is contingent. And thank you for demonstrating, maybe that's a sign of a good philosopher, how a seemingly innocent distinction between do things change or do they not, has these really important fundamental uh, impacts and, and, and uh, 
uh, influences on how we think of the world and of ourselves, and uh, we appreciate that. Thank you for all the questions. My apologies to Hendrik Abdalla at the back there here, many others who wanted to, to ask questions, but please use the time. Uh, we'll uh, be able to uh, access the fruits of the Huguenots' labor, among other things. Please do stay and join us. And once again, thank you, John, so much for the lecture.